what type of training is best to build your mitochondria? Should you do zone two, VO2 max training, or even sprint interval training? This is what we're gonna talk about in this video. First, we're gonna see what mitochondria is, how your muscle fibers impact the type of mitochondria that you have, and in the end, which type of training will build the most and the best mitochondria possible. So let's start with what is mitochondria. Mitochondria is where your body uses oxygen. Mitochondria is present in almost every single cell of your body, except for red blood cells. We're not exactly sure why your muscles contain a lot of mitochondria between three and nine percent of the volume of your cells is full of mitochondria your neurons have a lot of mitochondria as well and those little things are there to essentially help bring energy to your cells and how is that done well it uses food stuff so the things that you eat whether it's carbs fats or proteins and it's going to break those down and then we're going to add some oxygen in there and a whole bunch of reactions and boom you got some energy that you can use to maintain your cellular structures build new structures like muscle and so forth and also power muscular activity uh, such as endurance or even strength so mitochondria is absolutely key when it comes to not only your performance but also your health uh, I actually saw a paper recently that outlined that mitochondria are now considered as being part of the category of immune cells, right? So the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, but it is also part of your immune system. And we want to build healthy mitochondria, uh, and that's going to allow our cells to function better. And if our cells function better, we can perform better and we can live a better and longer life as well. So this is really the importance of mitochondria. It's actually the only place inside your body where you can use oxygen. Oxygen by itself is toxic unless it can be used inside uh, of your, your mitochondria. So without the mitochondria, literally we would be just anaerobic cells, anaerobic organisms. We would not be able to, to live and breathe and move around as we do today. And it's actually the fusing of unicellular organisms and mitochondria, which was a bacteria um, millions of years ago, the fusing of those two, that in part allowed um, complex organisms such as humans uh, to, de to develop themselves over uh, the, or the course of the time course of the, of the history of the, of the earth. So now we understand a little bit better what mitochondria is and why it's so important for our health and for our performance. And to understand how we can train, how we can develop that pool of mitochondria, we also need to understand the different types of muscle fibers that we find inside the body. And if we were going to keep it super simple, we can say that we have two types of muscle fibers. We have slow twitch fibers and we have fast twitch fibers. And the way that those different fibers work is explained in their name, meaning that the slow twitch uh, contracts at a slower speed and the fast twitch fiber contracts at a faster speed. The slow twitch fiber is very energy efficient. Why? Because it contains a lot of mitochondria uh, and it also costs less to run. So when you perform a contraction or a cycle of contraction with a slow twitch uh, muscle fiber, you're actually going to use less energy than when you do the same with a fast switch fiber simply because the fast switch fiber because of its twitch speed has to contract more times to perform the same work over a certain amount of time compared to the slow twitch fiber so the fast switch fiber costs more to run uh, and it also fatigues a lot faster guess why because it has less mitochondria so we have to understand uh, the difference between those fiber types because that is going to lead us to also knowing what type of training is going to help us the most and why is that? Uh, because of a phenomenon called the Henneman principle, the Henneman size principle. And that principle simply says that uh, the body is going to recruit, is going to use uh, motor units in, or in sequence, uh, in order of importance, uh, compared to the force that needs to be generated and the threshold needed to activate those motor units. So let's break this down to try to make it accessible and as simple as possible. A motor unit is composed of uh, a neuron and the axon and a, a multitude of muscle fibers that are attached to it. So we could take uh, two very simple examples in line with what we talked about in relationship to the muscle fibers before. So we have a small motor unit, which will have a neuron, an axon, and maybe five or 10 slow twitch fibers that are attached to it. 
And on the other uh, extreme or the other end of the spectrum, we might have a really big uh, motor unit, which will have, again, a neuron, but that has a much higher uh, level of activation. So the neuromuscular uh, impulse needs to be much, much uh, higher in order to activate and recruit this motor unit. Again, neuron, axon, and instead of five or 10 fibers, we might have 50, 100 or more fast twitch fibers that are attached to this uh, motor neuron. And so we have a slow, uh, we have a, uh, a small, sorry, uh, motor unit and a big motor unit. And what the body does, because it's very efficient, it doesn't want to waste energy. So if you have a simple task uh, to accomplish, for example, just standing up, staying upright, well, what are we going to do? We're going to use uh, those postural muscles, as we sometimes call it, that are the predominantly slow twitch uh, fiber dominant muscle groups. And so it's not going to cost a lot to run, right? They're going to be easily activated, easily recruited. Uh, it does, it's not going to take a whole lot of neuromuscular impulse to do that. Uh, and we're going to be able to do this efficiently because we have a lot of mitochondria, good blood flow, good capillary density, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but now if we take the other extreme, if we try to do a sprint, for example, it could be on a bike, it could be on a, on a track if you're running. Uh, now you need a lot of force to be generated uh, in a very short amount of time. So your body is going to recruit as much as many motor units as possible, and it's going to activate those higher threshold, those bigger motor units, which are again, attached, attached to those fast twitch fibers. So what we understand now is that which type of fiber you recruit uh, is going to be determined by the intensity of the effort that you're pushing. And to go one step farther, before we talk about which training you should do uh, to develop your mitochondria, we also know that the type of mitochondria that you have uh, varies depending on whether that's in a slow twitch fiber or a fast twitch fiber. And there's a really interesting paper. You can type in need for speed in uh, pubmed.com and you'll find this paper. I think it's free access. Uh, if it's not, send me a message below. And what they outline in this, uh, in this pretty recent paper is how mitochondria functions differently, whether it's in a slow twitch or a fast twitch fiber. And very simply, mitochondria in the slow twitch fiber is gonna grow by, um, by creating more uh, volume, they call it volume density. So essentially, the mitochondria is gonna take up more space inside the cell as you recruit and train those slow twitch fibers. We'll see what, ki what kind of training uh, allows you to do that. Uh, but that's the slow twitch fiber. So they have this type of mitochondria that kind of grows in capacity, grows in volume, grows in density as uh, you, you train it. And on the other side, we have the, the fast switch fiber. And for this type of fiber, what's happening is that instead of growing in volume, it's actually gonna grow in, we could call it function, we could call it uh, efficiency, uh, but essentially per unit of mitochondria, per volume density of mitochondria, by training those fast switch fibers, you're going to uh, make them consume more oxygen. And another thing that's gonna happen very interestingly at very high intensities, so if we talk about sprint interval training, and maybe that's a good time to transition into the different types of training and what they do, uh, sprint interval training, what's been found is that it actually prunes your mitochondria, meaning that mitochondria is, is, is it's, it, the kind of tunnels, right? The kind of uh, long, long, it's like a network inside your, uh, it's like a network inside your cell. Think of the power grid. Uh, and it, it's literally a network inside your cell that's going to that's going to recycle and bring ATP uh, for the different functionings of the cell itself, for the contractile properties of the cell. And this power grid is organized kind of with long tubes. You could see them as like spaghettis or worms. And what happens is that the more functional, quote unquote, parts of the mitochondria stays in the middle and the more defective parts go to the edges, go to the ends of the spaghetti. And sprint interval training, uh, in addition to recruiting and training those fast switch fibers, uh, so by, by making them consume more oxygen, essentially, per unit of mitochondria, uh, it's also going to prune, so it's going to cut off the ends of those mitochondrial structures and get rid of the less functional parts. Uh, and I th we, we think that this is in part why the, when you measure a, a certain amount of mitochondria and how much oxygen they can use um, before a training intervention with sprint interval training, and when you measure that same thing afterwards, what we see is an increase in mitochondrial respiration. So per unit of mitochondria, more oxygen is being used 
uh, in those in those structures. Uh, and again, it's probably for those two reasons, because we're pruning the parts that don't work so well. And we're also increasing the amount of oxygen that can be used up in the mitochondria. And there's about give or take three times less mitochondria in the fast switch fibers compared to the slow switch fibers, but they use up three times more oxygen uh, than the slow switch fibers per unit of mitochondria. These are all uh, averages uh, that, I, that I got from the, the, this paper I mentioned, Need for Speed. Um, and uh, that kind of illustrate the difference between those uh, different types of fibers. So we talked about sprint interval training. Uh, you might have known, you, you might know this type of training under the name of Wingate, Wingate sprints. Typically 30 seconds all out, three to four minute rest, repeated three to four times. That's a typical protocol. You could do shorter, you could do a little bit longer. It's very painful training, I can guarantee that. Uh, all out, meaning really 30 seconds, the bike is the best modality to do this. You sit on the bike, you find a resistance or a gear that allows you to reach between 110 and 130 RPMs after eight seconds when you're really reaching your peak wattage, peak power. Uh, and again, you hold on for dear life for 30 seconds. Uh, it's very, very painful, uh, but it has very kind of fast uh, effects on those changes by predominantly changing the mitochondria inside your fast switch fibers. Okay, because remember what type of muscles you recruit, what type of muscle fibers you stimulate and fatigue and adapt will depend on the type of training that you do. So sprint interval training, wind gate sprints, super, super high intensity work, super maximal work as we call it. Uh, that was is going to primarily increase the respiration capacity of your fast switch fibers. And this is good. This is important. Okay. And now we can take the other extreme, zone two training, low intensity training. What type of fibers are we using there? So if you follow me so far and if everything made sense, I hope so, uh, we're going to use predominantly slow twitch fibers for this low intensity effort. Almost exclusively the small motor units, the slow twitch fibers for zone two uh, efforts. So what's gonna happen there, we're gonna grow the capacity, the mitochondrial capacity of those uh, slow twitch fibers and uh, that can grow from about 3% up to 9% in highly trained endurance athletes. Uh, and, and so there's, there's a high trainability and we know the impact of that mitochondria, that additional mitochondria on uh, performance, on recovery and on longevity and health as well. Uh, so two types of training, two different adaptations because we're recruiting and fatiguing two different types of muscle fibers. And in the middle, we have the VO2 max or high intensity or HIT training as some call it. And this is kind of the best of both worlds. It's kind of the in-between because we are going to see adaptations on both sides. We're gonna see increased capacity in the slow switch fibers. We're gonna see increased uh, function in the fast switch fibers because again, those different muscle fibers adapt differently to the stimulus and the mitochondria adapts differently. Uh, so to conclude this video, the type of training you do is going to dictate which type of muscle fiber you recruit and what type of adaptation you get on the back end. Now to add one thing that is usually left out of this conversation of which training is better for your mitochondria, which training is better for your VO2 max, which is not exactly the same question because there's other parameters uh, outside the muscle that come into play when we talk about VO2 max. But if we stick with the mitochondria, which type is better? Well, we have to consider that all those train, all those training sessions, all those types of sessions will be beneficial and will help grow your mitochondrial pool uh, and will have a positive impact on your performance and on your health. But we have to think about the cost associated with each one of those sessions. Low intensity session, predominantly slow twitch fiber that are going to improve mitochondrial capacity. Very, very low fatigue profile on these sessions because we're usually at a two to three out of 10 in terms of intensity. On the other side of the spectrum, sprint interval training, primarily going to recruit and fatigue and adapt your fast switch fibers and uh, increase the respiratory capacity of that mitochondria inside the fast switch fibers. But 10 out of 10 every single time, very high fatigue profile for those sessions. And VO2 max sessions, not too far off the sprint, because we're typically gonna be at an eight or a nine out of 10 RPE. Again, this is kind of the middle, so we get both adaptations, uh, and it's probably the best type of session for a beginner to do, uh, because we are gonna see uh, yield high returns on a small investment at the start, but we shouldn't try and just do high intensity training 
forever all the time it is not the only thing that matters because we have to consider this fatigue parameter and how much the session costs us per se so that we can have a coherent training plan and take into account the global training load uh, as well as what adaptations we get from this session or that session i hope i was able to answer this question around mitochondria i hope everything was clear i look forward to reading your questions below this video and i'll see you in the next one